Hello, everyone. This is the Uncivilized Podcast. My name is Artemis, and this is episode 24. With me, I have Flowerbomb and Baba Yaga from Warzone Distro. How are you two doing today? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing all right. It's it's almost summer, and I'm I'm ready for the weather to to act normal and not be bipolar. Right, right. So <laughs> it's been a while. The last time you were on was basically three years ago on episode eight, which was called "Revisiting Revisiting Anarchist Nihilism," where we had the beautiful beef and and responding to claims about what happened between your team aragorn everything that happened at the green scare so what's happened since then what what can we get what's the tldr um i would say i've done a lot of reflecting on um a lot of stuff with aragorn and just like leftism in general i know it sounds really like just repetitive um people probably assume that i like fixate on like criticizing the left and always talking about this shit i really don't like as a matter of fact for the most part i've been off the internet and just like working on like other projects aside from writing and then um just working on like trying to live more nomadically and travel around and meet people and just really have fun that isn't like centered around like debating and stuff but one thing that i can say is that i've been like going over uh aragorn's writing more and realizing more and more that there were quite a few similarities that we shared i mean you know like i mentioned before um it was kind of kind of a weird situation because aragorn seemed to at least publicly make claims that like myself and or warzone distro were in on what all went down with him but we really weren't we had no idea any of that was happening and we were kind of like we were a little upset about it because we invited lbc to that book for to that book fair for the purpose of kind of like agitating the left you know we wanted to create a book fair that was for all the like reject distros and shit but Mm -hmm. um but the thing is, Aragorn and I talked privately on Facebook um, a little bit before and a little bit after. And we actually got along really well because we bonded about some of the like very authoritarian trends that we were seeing emerging from leftism. Um, and we both realized that we were both kind of receiving the same kind of like threats of being canceled and, you know, Uh, people telling us to conform to like their idea of what anarchy is and so on and so forth so um very recently maybe in the few in the past few months i've been kind of reading aragorn's like writing on anarchists and nihilism and stuff and realizing wow we we actually could have had a lot of uh conversations and it was just kind of like damn Mm -hmm. he fucking died before like anything like that and i was actually hoping um i was in the middle of inviting him to do an interview together to basically like be like yeah like shit happened to you but also fuck leftism you know and we never got around to being able to materialize that yeah so what you want to touch on some of those a couple of those similarities what does that look like and and maybe what is the development of those ideas look like for you in warzone distro generally so it seems to me based on some of the uh writing that Aragorn did, that Aragorn and us, you know, Baba Yaga, Warzone Distro, that we both, that we all came to the same nihilist conclusions based on very, very similar experiences. And as a result of coming to nihilist conclusions, um, we received a lot of, like, uh, responses from leftists very similar responses almost like totally identical for example um aragorn was basically talking to me about how you know he's really not this asshole that everybody thinks he is you know Mm -hmm. but that he reacts the way that he does to leftists because he's sick of leftists coming and flipping his tables tearing up his zines like he's been like physically confronted numerous times by leftists simply because he's a nihilist simply because lbc was doing anarcho nihilism long before warzone so he had a lot more personal experiences with that so he was a bit on guard even with being invited to green scare he was a bit on guard 
And the more that we talked about that, the more I realized how embarrassing on my part it was that I invited him to that distro basically as a way of being like, okay, you know what? There is a space for like green, crazy, scary, like nihilist only for him to receive the same treatment that he would receive at leftist book fairs. And it like, it gave green scare, like a weird name amongst like the nihilists that did show up because they were like, well, yeah, like we thought this was going to be a place where like, we were actually going to be able to have good conversations and shit. And it ended up being that a few leftists ended up coming and somehow isolating uh aragorn um and lbc and um i i don't know i i told aragorn i was like yeah that that really sucks and you know that wasn't really us but we're thinking about doing green scare again and you should definitely come and we should definitely do like an interview to kind of show people that Warzone was not behind you know teaming up on the scary fucking asshole aragorn and it kind of reminded me of myself too because Maybe I'm, I'm, I consider myself a pretty friendly person, but I am also ideologically confrontational when I see people like, you know, claiming to be one thing, but then like advocating entirely contradictory like lifestyles and shit. And it's not that I'm trying to be like, oh, you should do this or you shouldn't do that. I just like to poke holes in people's like ideological incompatibilities, you know? And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that's, I want to say, I appreciate you being honest. It's not just, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, you're saying it was, you know, you're looking at it like it was a situation that you didn't intentionally create, but it still happened in your space. And I can appreciate that you can acknowledge that because I think it's far too easy for people to push blame. Like, eh, yeah, it was in my space, but it wasn't my fault. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I did, I did take responsibility. Um, because I did lead Aragorn to believe that this was going to be an event that was going to be different. I did lead him to believe that because naturally when we invited him, see, the thing is, Aragorn and I already had personal differences surrounding veganism. Uh, they weren't nearly as huge as, you know, the differences that people have with Aragorn and like tabling a Tassa and shit like that. But we had already had our issues and they weren't that big of a deal to begin with. I just was like, yeah, you're a fucking hypocrite. <laughs> and he was just like, oh, you're a fucking moralist. You know, and it's just like, OK, whatever. But I invited him being like, yo, like, yeah, y'all get picked on by leftists all the time. This is going to be a different space. And you know what? You'll actually be able to table the zines that you have, which are very like similar to the kind of shit we table. And people will actually be able to engage and you'll be able to make cool connections. And Aragorn was like, okay, cool, we'll do it. And they did. And then all that shit went down. And I was like, oh, uh, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, but yeah, uh, not everybody gets along. Some people are just not compatible with others. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just the way it is. But I didn't expect mm -hmm. that kind of thing to happen, you know? Right. Right. Let me let me ask um, what because you're talking about leftism and the last time no, I, no, that's wrong. It wasn't the it was the first time we had you on also closer to four years ago, episode six. Um, a lot of people messaged me like, hey, I'm like halfway through these people come off. They said right prim as in right wing primitivist because you're like talking, you know, you're attacking identity politics and identity essentialism. To you, can you can can you contextualize a little bit of this anti-leftism and what do you define as leftism and what do you understand as the issue in your mind and wars perhaps war zone generally the issue of identity politics? Yeah, so I I actually am not too familiar with the term uh, right prim, so I'm just gonna go ahead and just it's meaningless. It just means uh, a person who kind of comes off right wing as in just it's a meaningless term. Some people call like Kaczynski a right prim. You know, as in the sense of like someone who's like primitivist or anti-tech, but not, not, you know, a lot of primitivists are still pretty leftist. And so they have this idea of leftism that they have, but then they kind of, they're performatively leftist. So it's kind of, it's more like a, 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 a pejorative than it is a meaningful term. I want to be clear on that. So, okay. Thank you. I definitely appreciate, I definitely appreciate that. Um, that explanation so my my first reaction to that term is i would like to ask the people that make these accusations 
what right winger do you know that advocates for the decomposition of a society in which all individuals, instead of being subordinate to the idea of unity, would be like, fuck this, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. Like, what right winger advocates for a society like that when a society can't exist if every individual just fucks off and does their own thing? Like, like mm-hmm. that 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 is an incompatibility. That doesn't make any fucking sense. So that leads me to believe that when they say right wing, in other words, they have already moralized and framed anything that is anti, like, you know, uh, social conformity as like, mm-hmm. oh, well, you're a right winger because right wingers believe in like individual freedom to be capitalist oppressors or whatever. And it's just like, oh, that's the other thing too. Like, where in the fucking any of my writing or like any of these people's writing does it say we should continue to uphold statism, continue to uphold capitalism, continue to uphold any sort of technological infrastructure that would require a workforce that is based in social conformity. Like, all of these things are essential to right-wing ideology. Like, right-wingers would not have the power that they have if nobody was there to build the shit that they want to fucking have in society. They would have mm-hmm. to do it themselves and good fucking luck doing it themselves. And if even if they did do it themselves, good for them, because at least that's the most individualist thing, really genuinely individualist thing that I'd ever see about a right winger. But otherwise, it just sounds like a reactionary term, you know, like a boogeyman term, like eco-fascist or, or whatever other names people call people that they don't like in order to get other people to make assumptions about those people. Fucking psyop mm-hmm. shit, you know? Well, and I think that... Uh... I think a lot of the time, and I could be wrong about this, um, but I think that uh, when we attack the the ways in which people want to handle, uh, you know, the existence of racism or the existence of sexism, et cetera, et cetera, um, I think that they think we don't believe it exists, <laughs> and uh, you know, we obviously do believe that that exists in you know in our current situation, uh, but we just disagree about how is the best way to handle that. Right. The best way to uh, uh, attack that. And So your question about like identity politics, my issue, my issue is that leftists, they op- their, their ideology operates in a circle. They recognize how uh, identity constructs oppress people, but then their solution to that is to create the inverse of what those identity constructs do. But at the root of it, the identity constructs are still intact. And that's what I don't understand about leftist anarchists is that as an anarchist, my understanding of anarchy is addressing things at the root. The root of these problems is the fact that we allow socially constructed identities to govern our daily activities. And rather Mm -hmm. than leftism recognizing that these identity constructs do not serve in any way on an individual level. They only serve in turning individuals into groups of people. And then if you are able to dominate a group of individuals with an identity or an ideology, you can control the trajectory of what they do with their lives. In this case, we see how capitalism and colonialism and industrial society have assigned everybody these identities, turned us into groups, and therefore turned these groups into uh, stratified classes in which all these stratified classes end up working against each other, ultimately in favor of maintaining and reproducing industrial society. So as an individualist, I encourage people on an individual level to question how identities how do they govern their lives? Like, how do identities relate to the things that they want to do with their lives? And how much does um, identity politics itself um, have the ability to influence our per- our perspectives, um, influence our perception of the world around us? You know, like, we, we see each other in the terms that colonization has assigned to us. We don't see each other as unique individuals with complex histories. It's a lot easier to make assumptions about people, control people, and be disconnected from people when we can categorize people, you know, because categories yeah. are oversimplifications. And mm-hmm. we, we see this across the board. We see this with everything. And the failure of the left is the fact that leftism has uh, it leftism validates 
all of the like marginalized identities as groupings and therefore feels if we can just educate these groupings of people, we can steer them into class revolt, not realizing that just because you're black doesn't mean you're anti-cop. Just because you're brown doesn't mean that you're pro-work. Like, just because you're white doesn't mean that you're pro-capitalism. Like, there's all these assumptions, um, all these different realities that they don't take into consideration when they only see people in terms of identity rather than complex, unique beings, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, is it fair to say, like, almost the long and the short of it is that identity politics is a is a response to a real thing that the different the oppressions of people based off social categories but it's going it's almost acting to reaffirm those categories as opposed to the deconstruction of them yes absolutely okay and so how would you respond to someone because I'm, I'm i'm not gonna play devil's advocate but i'm trying to think how other people would respond if <laughs> someone said well you know if you can't really could in 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 america you are there's the racist structures of colonialism so against people and uh, who are identified as indigenous or people who are black it's like well it doesn't change the fact that they are oppressed because they're black like how would you respond like do you think someone can misconstrue that is oh that's just like conservative like rugged individualism like what is the role in acknowledging oppression but also not wanting to essentialize one's identity so basically what you're what you're presenting is um the people who say that just because you're black doesn't mean that you experience racism um that's what you're saying right yeah so like if you said like oh well this like you know you know don't essentialize let's say blackness you know let's take that example because that's the common one people talk about what it's like to be black is that, yeah someone might not choose to do that but they're still oppressed for being black or they still have struggles that people of other backgrounds or other identities don't like what is the relationship between acknowledging those realities but not a, not essentializing them i guess okay so as a person of color myself this is a pretty easy question uh pretty pretty easy thing for me to uh try to articulate because it comes down to the individual again. And before someone says, oh, that's just a cop out, you just obsessed with individualism, well, think about it. Every individual has a unique experience to the word oppression. Uh, people have unique ways of relating and responding to forms of social oppression, social prejudice um, across the board. There are people who recognize that while we live in a structurally oppressive system, they don't experience that oppression themselves because either they're desensitized to it or perhaps they have learned different ways of combating it whenever it occurs. And then there's people who have not developed these, uh, these abilities or whatever you want to call them in response to like oppression and things like that. So yeah, like, Everybody has a unique response to these things. So what we know, what we can, what we can at least prove pretty easily is that the way that industrial society is set up is it's set up in terms of racial and gendered oppression. It's a hierarchy and um, capitalism favors some individuals more than others. But as we have seen how capitalism evolves in response to a collective awareness of how these forms of oppression work. Now capitalism has begun integrating different people of color within workplaces in ways that are supposed to uphold the illusion of like diversity and equality, because these things have now become very popularized um, and are very good advertisement points for like businesses and shit. So then it's like, well, how many people are still being discriminated versus how many people were discriminated back then. But I always try to think about the root. The root is we still have people that are denying the reality that in order to survive, we have to surrender our time over in exchange for labor for a piece of paper in order to afford a place that has now went up almost three times in terms of the ability to live. 
So when it comes down to, oh, well, some people experience depression, some people don't, that might be true. But we're not necessarily talking about how many people experience it. We're talking about the fact that we live within a prison-like system in which everything that we interact with is rigged up in terms of racial and gender depression. Does that answer that question for you? Yeah, it does. Have you ever, um, I'm really curious, has anyone ever consider, called you a class reductionist for, for those kinds of arguments? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they have. Um, <laughs> And I'm not I'm not academic enough to know like how to navigate like when someone starts using things like that. But I I'm just like okay, call me a class reductionist or whatever. But like really think about it. Like everybody experiences things differently. Like you are not going to convince all black people that freedom is the path that they should take because there are some black people that are like, no, I want to be rich. I want to be like a white capitalist. I'm sick of being broke. That is a reality. Like, you're never going to change that. And any leftist that tries to say that that's not true, okay, you show me a hood that you successfully organized. Show me hoods that have successfully organized in a way that actually challenges capitalism. It didn't just turn into, for example, like drug turfs and shit, because that is like the fucking history of gangs, of gangs in LA, gangs in the Midwest, gangs on the East Coast. They start out as these community empowerment projects, but eventually where there's root power, they eventually devolve into, well, shit, we could make money this way. Well, I don't think, I think it's oversimplistic to call you a class reductionist because, you know, it's not like you don't acknowledge, you know, racism, for example, uh, you know, when when you see it, you know, it's not like you've never said like, Hey, I think that guy responded to me that way because I'm not white, you know, right. or like, you know, we fucking go out and we fucking fight proud boys and shit like that. You know, like, uh, you know, yeah, we're, we're not saying that that doesn't exist. We're not saying that's not a part of the society we live in. You know? mm-hmm. I think, I think leftists have difficulty, continue to have difficulty. And I don't mean this in any condescending sense. I'm not trying to be condescending. People have, people have told me that I sound condescending. I don't mean to sound condescending. I mean it literally. If I'm wrong, I'm always open to being criticized. Um, I think leftists struggle with seeing individualism as another option. I think they struggle with, think, with seeing that because if you look at the way that their ideology is set up, their ideology is set up in a way to view everyone in terms of groups, Mm -hmm. unity, community, communal, like this is like the core of their ideology. And therefore they have difficulty seeing any other way of life outside of that without thinking like, oh, well, you must deny there's a problem if you're not depressed. It's like, no, I'm fucking depressed. Of course (laughs) I'm fucking angry. Of course I'm impoverished. But the solution you've presented in which all of us will unite together and throw it that's that hasn't happened and until it does i don't want to keep waiting for other people i want to do shit with my own life here and now and make my life worthy to myself and i can do that by enacting anarchy on an individual level without depending on the organized body to liberate myself you know i feel like that in of itself is a hierarchy that leftists often deny well and you know from uh they're spaced out too uh, <laughs> and uh and the idea that you know there's only one way to be anti-racist or anti-oppressive when you know from reading their own literature that is often it's often apparent that that's not the case you know yeah mm-hmm. interesting okay so let's let's pull it back a little bit and talk about because we now have all the ideas floating around how do those relate to war zone in the work that you're doing because i realized in our first two episodes we talked about green scare and you as individuals but what is what does war zone mean what is its history and where does it fit into like the nihilist anarchist uh history i guess well anybody that is you know trying to argue against any of my ideas in good faith would have you know went to war zone distro and noticed that all of the like first zines that I published were actually very leftist, were very leftist, unity, community, all these things, because when I first started uh, really getting active with the idea of anarchism, I was a leftist. And the reason why I started Warzone Distro in the first place was because I wanted to disseminate um, radical literature in the hood 
where, you know, this information was not readily available. And the reason I chose the name Warzone is because I feel like, especially, you know, living in the hood, it is a, it is a war zone. This is a war zone. Like, people seem to treat daily life as if, you know, everything is fine. That's because of the spectacle of normality. When you normalize something, it has this tendency to make it seem like it's okay, like nothing is wrong because it's normal. Order, civilization, industrial society are based on order because people view order as like peace and maintenance. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to challenge that narrative by presenting the idea that everyday life is war zone because everyday life there is structural institutional violence and poverty and death and murder all around mm -hmm. us all the time i mean industrial society itself is death by design to wildlife to like all the animals that try to cross a road from one section of the forest to another you see them laying on the sides of the road that is because anthropocentrism is death by design this is a war zone there's nothing in my opinion it's it's nothing less than that and to consider it like okay because it's normalized that just facilitates this illusion that capitalism wants the way that capitalism uses like you know pride friendly imagery or like all these smiling faces or the way that like uh mcdonald's or fucking uh happy cow company uses like smiling cows and chickens to like advertise yeah. food that derives from like slaughtered beings like all of this shit is intended to uphold the illusion of order and peace and i like to challenge that so that's where that name came from okay interesting i always thought it was just because it was edgy and i love it that's my <laughs> thing i think <laughs> So where does where does Warzone fit into I guess the chronology of nihil nihilist anarchism? Because you talked about LBC was doing it before. Are there inspirations? Because you and I were talking out of the out of the space. We were talking about uh, from the shadows and Warbound, and you're talking about how those were really big for you. What other like where does it all fit? What fit in together? So um, actually, I discovered nihilism and individualism from a few individualist nihilists that i met at mayday marches um i i've never been much of a reader because i don't have i don't have like a really good attention span when it comes to that so i'm more of a visual and interactive learner which means that i learn best when i'm actually in the environment with whatever it is that i'm trying to learn from and for a very long time i was doing the leftist thing and i was coming to these not so popular conclusions that man like yeah we're in the hood like we got this really cool collective and we're doing like these film screenings and we're showing like you know anarchists fucking up nazis and yeah people are down with it but that's it people walk away are like yeah that's cool but i you know i'm i'm good on that you know what I mean? and um so coincidentally during that time i met some people that started challenging my own way of thinking and they started asking me questions about like well well what do you do when you can't organize people what do you do when you won't have a revolution what if a revolution was impossible and i started wondering about that i was like well fuck dude i, I don't know i don't want to go back to work i don't want to fucking reassimilate so there must be another lifestyle you know and um i started like finding individualist uh and nihilist writing kind of like mixed in with other leftist zines and shit at like uh, book fairs. And I, I wish there was a specific like distro that I could credit for the influence. There really isn't. I mean, a little mm -hmm. bit of every, a little bit of every distro, but none of them in particular. I didn't find out about LBC until way after the fact, but there were a couple zines that I came across. One of them was Out From the Shadows, and the other one was Warbound. And these two zines were written by a vegan straight-edge uh, green anarchist. 
And green anarchy has always come natural to me because I was very active in like vegan and environmental stuff before I really got into anarchism as like a movement. Um, but these zines gave me a whole different perspective because they they focused on direct action in terms of animal liberation front, earth liberation front, and then I was hooked. I was like, oh my God, wait a minute. So instead of just trying to organize people to like riot in the street with cops, which is great, there's all this other shit that could happen on a totally individual level. Right. And then, then I started seeing more like anarchist individualism in terms of like the bonnet gang and these like you know the 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 fucking uh the italian uh individualists that were like blowing shit up in america in like the early 1900s and then oh yeah uh, yeah and then i got into reading some shit by conspiracy cells of fire and like the chilean nihilist and I also realized too, it was really, it was a really interesting, uh, really interesting thing to see that a lot of these type of nihilists, as well as uh, folks in Mexico too, were also vegan. They were also environmentalists. They were also vegan. They were also anti civ And they were just like, yeah, why wait around for the movement when you can do shit? So then I started thinking, oh my God, like if people had been like reading zines from Warzone this far, it is possible there are people who have come to the same conclusions that I have. And so I'm going to start incorporating these zines on here as well. And then all of a sudden, Warzone Distro fucking like popped off. All of a sudden, people from other countries were telling me, like, thank you so much for distributing this. Like, you know, this shit's all over the world. And I was like, oh, cool. Awesome. And I also started encountering... Um, I, 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 it's such a long story. I'm trying to summarize it and I don't want to leave anything out. So sorry for talking so fucking long, but basically yeah, you're good. I'm here for it. Basically I had my own personal experiences where things just didn't line up. Things were not as what I thought they would be. And I started formulating my own individualist nihilist critiques without even like embracing these movements, the nihilist movement or individualist movement, I started having thoughts that more and more people were like, yeah, it sounds like you're, you're becoming more of like a nihilist or an individualist. And I was like, okay, I guess so. Like, if recognizing the severe limitations of leftism is like me becoming more post-left, then I guess that makes sense. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much where I am, and that's pretty much where Warzone is. And that's where a lot of friends of ours, like, you know, we, we got like a little crew of friends who have all had very similar trajectories. So we just kind of like share stories and experiences on that and, you know, help each other understand further. Like, yeah, this must be a thing happening all over, but you just don't hear about it a lot because it's not very good propaganda, you know, mass appeal propaganda. Yeah. So... I will say I some of my first interactions with you go back I believe to I believe it was iconoclastic monstrosity if yeah. I remember that's the I think that's the first thing I ever like that was any anything worth a damn I ever published and then I was like who is this person and I remember the first thing I read from you was really though not all black people give a fuck about white dreads um I remember reading this and then showing it to some friends I'm like what the fuck did I just read <laughs> and, and like how much like i remember people were like oh there's this this is one of those when identity doesn't matter and it's just all about whatever you want to do and i remember i was reading it and i was like i mean i know people i don't care so they're not wrong because the way i come from it it's like maybe i i personally find myself i'm gonna say more sympathetic to certain strands of identity politics i wouldn't even call them identity politics but other people would like what i call identity politics and what other people call them don't always line up like what i'm against is identity opportunism the idea it's you are x group you can't talk about y thing you know what i mean right right um but then i'm like so this idea it's like well you can't say that because that would offend black people it's like well, i mean we know there are like some of the most popular conservatives right now are people of color yes yes so like that doesn't work you can't say you can't homogenize everyone and the ironic thing is as a primitivist i get from leftists well you can't homogenize all indigenous people but then they immediately go around and homogenize indigenous and black people all the time for their own politics right you know? right it's just it's just that 
you know, I'm in a similar kind of orbit as you, I think, with that sort of like, that doesn't work. It's It almost comes down to maybe just talk to the fucking person and figure out what they believe. I know that's really hard for leftists to do is talk to people. Um, for people that really believe in mass movements, they are the most incapable of doing anything. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I just I find that really interesting when people when people do that. And I have students, mostly students who are black, and it's really interesting because a lot of them like there's a wide berth of like conservative black students, uh, students who are like radical black nationalists, and then students who are just kind of like oh, I'm not political, but a leftist would see them like oh they all they're all different, but they all have one common interest. You know what I mean? That's how a leftist would see them. It's like they're like tools to be used for a goal, as opposed to living human beings that have different interests. Right. That's that's exactly what I was trying to, in a long winded way, explain earlier is that like we, we come to understand that these identity labels, these categories are not accurate because they assume that everybody within them all think and share the same views when that is absolutely not true. And I feel like that's absolutely important. I feel like that is very, very, very important to any sort of anarchist project to recognize that people are different. Because if you just assume that people are all going to be on the same page, then you're going to find yourself disappointed. And you're also going to realize that it's also offensive to just make blanket assumptions about people based on identity. Like, how fucking ironic for leftists who claim to be anti-racist and anti-fascist to make statements that essentially treat black people as if they are a hive mind, as if black people on an individual level are incapable of thinking independently, having their own views, whether we agree with them or not, they are still independent views that they have chosen on their own. And if we try to like tell them, you know, oh, but this is actually good for you. How the fuck are we anti-authoritarians? Like the uh -huh. fact is, there's always been resistance. There's always going to be resistance, which is why I don't even believe in like the continuity of like community or anything like that, because it's like, okay, you might have you yourself and a couple of your friends, you know, because you all share like the same views and compatible personalities. But like, just because people live in the same geogra geographical place does not in any way mean that they all share the same views. I found that out personally from attempting to organize my hood, you know, and it was a very valuable learning experience. And I encourage leftists, if y'all really think that you are going to somehow organize a workforce in the future to reproduce industrial civilization, but, you know, in a more like nice and equal way, I dare you to bring these ideas to a hood door to door and get their opinion and see how fucking difficult it is going to be to try to do that. Like, it, you know, these kind of major complex industrial projects, you know, societal infrastructure, there's a common denominator, coercion. You have coercion. <clears throat> you, you have to have something to scare that many people to surrender all those moments of their lives to build a project that ultimately benefits people who are in totally different class uh, stratifications than them, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, Baba Yaga, I want to hear from you. What is what is your the direction you took to get to here now? What does it look like for you? Uh, <laughs> um, so I grew up, uh, I might have mentioned this at another time, I grew up in like rural farmland, so I never had any idea that, you know, <laughs> that anybody wouldn't want what we have now, you know. Um, yeah. but, uh, as I was growing up, I, I got very interested in like social justice, and you know, I was very focused on like, uh, you know, the the injustice that I, I see around me. Um, and uh, but but as I got like deeper into it, I started to feel <laughs> like I couldn't do anything right, you know. Um, that you know no matter how much I was doing, no matter how much anybody else was doing that, you know, that they were always fucking up. Everybody was always fucking up and not doing well enough. We were all, all racist all the time, you know? <laughs> and like, um, and I kind of, oh, I didn't, I didn't really question it too much. I didn't feel like there was really any other uh, option to being anti-racist until I met Flower Bomb. 
um, because I was told that like, well, anarchy is for white men and, you know, uh, you know, you just, I don't know, uh, I met Flower Bomb and they uh, kind of challenged some ideas that I had about, um, you know, there only being one way to, to fight oppression and yeah, the rest is history there. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I remember, I distinctly remember when I met you, I would bring up, I would bring up like nihilism or individualism and you were like, yeah, but like, you know, the thing is like, we, we have to do this. And I was like, well, notice you're <laughs> using the word we like who's we, because even like being on the same page as other social justice warriors or other leftists right. is difficult when everybody has a very unique kind of like a unique opinion on things. They want to all have the same view, but there's always disagreement and, and nobody is, is never like anti-racist enough. There's right. always, no, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to yeah. PayPal that black person or, yeah. yeah, but I really did very deeply want to help you, you know, and I still do want to help, you know, other people and help other beings and everything and uh yeah it just it felt like uh, i was just kind of spinning my wheels a lot of the time with that you know right sure gotcha so another thing and this is originally what i wanted to talk about but as we were talking over the phone i was like there's so much i want to fucking talk about um <laughs> What is, you've been talking about a lot of individualism and, Ved and uh, veganism you've touched on, and you have a piece, you've talked about veganism before, but you had this one I've read that I really liked, Egos to Vegan, some thoughts on individualist animal, animal liberation. What is the relationship between nihilism and individualism with veganism and animal, and animal liberation generally? And as a side question, would you, I know like we're all talking about like, oh, all the individual, it's the individual, not the label, but would you say you identify with the total liberation movement in some way? Uh, yeah. You know, the thing, the thing for me, total liberation, <laughs> I'm a very literal person. Okay. So when people mm -hmm. started throwing the phrase total liberation around, I took it literally like, yeah, total liberation. That's what I want. Total liberation. Um, and it, it only changed slightly like from when I was a leftist to being an individualist, but ultimately it's the same thing. I want total liberation from all forms of oppression. Um, I think it's a lot easier, for example, to articulate that for me, total liberation is pretty much the, it is what I mean when I say nihilism. Nihilism allows me total liberation because it helps me recognize all the social constructs in the world, all the like programs, all the moralism that have programmed us to basically be as disconnected from wildness as possible um, in relationship to veganism. Um, Moral anthropocentrism, a lot, of, a lot of people don't like to admit it, but anthropocentrism or human supremacy is a morality that allows people to feel justified and entitled to the bodies of other animals simply because they're animals. And mm -hmm. we can create and like, we can create all these different stories. We can be like, oh, indigenous people did it. Uh, oh, they don't feel any pain. Like we come up with all these fucking excuses in order to justify our domination of like you know uh animals and the wild in, in general and um leftists leftists are really fun with this because leftists will swear to god that you need you need to be like anti-racist or you need to recognize the oppression of women and this and that but oh boy when it comes to these beings who are literally being institutionally and and uh literally slaughtered you know, mm -hmm. uh, mutilated, commodified, objectified, consumed, uh, used for entertainment, used for, you know, uh, uh, labor and shit like that, all of a sudden they turn an eye. And that blows my mind. It's like, holy fuck. And maybe that's because of my bias as having been vegan before I became active in the anarchist movement. See, right. for me, you know what I mean? So for me, like being vegan was like, oh shit, wow, these animals are going through shit is really bad. And I did like the liberal vegan thing for a while. But then I was like, wait a minute though, like that's great that we got all these like new vegan products and they taste fucking good and I love to steal them and eat them. But also, we still have the entire infrastructure 
like industrial civilization, capitalism, uh, technology, all of these things are like built like through the destruction, the mutilation, the vivisection, the testing, all that shit on non-human animals. Non-human animals are like the fucking basis for what we use to like consume or oppress even like, you know, non-human or uh, human animals. And so for me, I'm like, that seems elementary. That seems fucking elementary that we would change our lives. We talk about anarchy and you know what? That's fucking great ideologies, you know, words, academia, poetry, even it's beautiful. It's moving. But what about when we change our lives, when we materialize these ideas into actual relationships with the world around us, like how does that relationship to non-human animals, how, how, how does that not come to mind when we're talking about anti-authoritarianism? Do you would you say that consistent veganism then, if we're understanding you correctly, consistent veganism means the abolition of civilization because civilization is inherently anti-animal? Okay. Yeah, I would I would say that's absolutely accurate. Um because that that's exactly what it is. I mean, we can look at ourselves and we can look at how like instead of like living the way that we, you know, that we lived, you know, engaging and interacting with the wild the way we do, like we drive around in cars, we've got fucking shoes to protect our feet, which actually don't protect our feet. They just They're form actually our horrible feet. for you. They're horrible <laughs> yeah. for you. <clears throat> Like you can see, even on an individual level, you can see this clearly on a collective level, on a social level, and but you could also see this on an individual level, how everything about industrial society is trying to erase all senses of like being an animal, you know, all histories of being an animal. We could see that in history class when all we talk about is how the forefathers like you know, ventured out and created this wonderful fucking paradise, <laughs> which is actually a fucking civilized nightmare. Killed all the bison and sage. And <laughs> right. Like, for mm -hmm. me, for me, veganism is, is the restoration, the rewilding of the most fundamental aspect of, like, critiquing civilization, which is restoring our relationship to other animals and recognizing that we are not inherently above them. We are not inherently this like uh superior being at all like we're quite the opposite like it's unbelievable to me how many self-identifying anarchists try to make claims that like humans are somehow natural meat eaters and it's just like fucking flat teeth and no claws like go ahead and try to fucking catch a deer and eat it like get the <laughs> fuck out of here you know mm -hmm. but but with all of that said, like, it, it, you don't even need to, like, go down, like, the natural route or whatever. If you, if you seriously believe in critiquing authority and critiquing civilization, then that, for me, that's, that's the first step, is recognizing that all the hierarchies and all the divisions between us and other animals are all socially constructed to uphold the civilized idea that we're superior. Yeah, let me, you know, you're reminding me a lot. I originally had done an interview with Rhea Del Montana fucking forever ago. The audio got so corrupted, couldn't do anything with it, and we've never gotten around to redoing anything. Would you, with what your idea here, the kind of the kind of the history you're getting into of the natural argument is reminding me of Ecopatriarchy, The Origins of Nature and Hunting. Would you say that that book is kind of representative of your understanding of the critique of that? of that his that pro pro carnist i guess if that's the word or pro carnist history is that like a fair text to 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 base you off of yeah um the thing about the thing about ria and the thing about that book is i think ria is unbelievably underrated mm -hmm. i believe that ria has a wealth of anti-authoritarian information that so many people could benefit from but it's just there's so many people that are still saturated with and submerged within this leftist pro-industrial way of thinking this very like mechanistic way of thinking that like ria is just the furthest thing from being perceived as valuable but I, I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I'm not actually like very book smart at all. And so 
I never really relied on like what people did in the past. To me, it doesn't matter because I'm here now. And, you know, I'm sure there weren't like nihilists or anarchists, you know, the way that I am an anarchist or nihilist back then. But this is my life and this is what I feel. And, and this is based off what I perceive as the enemy around me. But Rhea fills in a lot of fucking blanks that just, mm-hmm. further, you know what I mean? Like further, like, oh, wow, I didn't even fucking think of that. Like one of the like first things Rhea brought up to me that I thought was absolutely compelling is uh, we were having a conversation about this. And Rhea said, well, think about it this way. Like, you know, the food industry uses all these ideas, you know, this very over overly narrow interpretation of indigenous people by saying like oh yeah bows and arrows you know and forks and spoons you know hunting clearly they hunted and she's like but think about this though what about the foragers who didn't need utensils or tools to get their food they used their fingers to go around and forage and they survived but because they didn't leave anything behind they're, it's almost as if they're completely erased from history. And I was like, holy shit. Like, that's fucking true. You know what I mean? Like, looking at my life, like, you're not going to fucking see anything like that with me because I believed in veganism. I, I believed in fucking, like, eating with my hands and shit, you know? And I just thought about how history can be uh, can be weaponized in a way to like control or not control, but like uphold dominating narratives. And she provides at the very least, like a challenge to those narratives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. So you're not, you said you're not super into the history and you're not, you know, for lack of a better term, a bookworm about this or an academic, but so do you think then, because we're talking about the naturalness argument. So do you think then that there was a, uh, with the growth of hunting, I, how do I frame this in a way that's not going to go over everyone else's head? Do you think that hunting was like the first or something related to hunting, even if it's scavenging, was like the first step towards an authoritarian culture? Which is, that's my impression of kind of what Rhea talks about. Would you kind of agree with that? Um. It's really, you know, because the thing about history is it's not linear. Like there, Mm -hmm. you know, we have this idea because we utilize the social construct of time in order to quantify chaos. We have a tendency to view history and things that occur in a linear fashion. But in reality, they're more like, you know, a a rhizome or like uh, they just it's chaos. You know what I mean? Everything happens everywhere, depending on what those circumstances is. But with that said, Um, I could definitely see how, like, um, organized hunting could turn into more and more socially organized forms of domination um, the same way that, like, I I mean, shit, you got corporations that come together and then they go into a neighborhood and they dominate that fucking neighborhood with bulldozers and they build their own shit. Like... It's not exactly hunting, but it is a it is it is a very similar model of coming together and then going out and then like ambush attacking the same way that the police raid, you know, different events. It's the same thing. They, they conspire, they organize and then they ambush and they take over. Like I could see this as a thing that would like develop and maybe it went from, you know, hunting to hey the same method that we hunt we could like take out this tribe or this area and anybody that had the disadvantage of not knowing that organizational structure was pretty much at the mercy of those who did so um Interesting. Yeah. i definitely have heard that as like a uh you know the origin of like patriarchy that like you know a division of labor you know the men go out and hunt the women stay home and take care of the children and forage you know that like once you have that like division of labor with with the sexes you know that starts to become hierarchical you know right exactly hierarchy within itself yeah yeah and it's amazing to me that there's a lot of like anti-civ uh even nihilist even individualist types that like are okay with reproducing that 
And it doesn't make sense to me because it, if anything, it exposes the limitations of their like individualist or nihilist thinking. If they're willing to like reproduce a model that will ultimately lead back to everything that we currently have, like I'm trying to fight that shit as hard as I can, like at its infancy, like I'm not willing to like allow it the potential to like reproduce the society all over because we've seen how that happens. Like, look at us now, like, we, we've allowed things to become so fucking big that we can't fucking do anything about it. I mean, we can fight, you know, in a nihilistic sense, we can fight till we die, and just for the sake of not letting it easily continue its domination, which I'm totally, you know, in favor of, but I'm just saying, like, look how big shit got, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'm following you a little bit. So... How do I, let me think about this. So would you say the only consistent anti-authoritarianism then is vegan? Like, do, do you think someone, t the only way someone can be consistently anti-authoritarian is to be vegan? I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, the wording sounds, it sounds similar to like, you know, you're anti-authoritarian as long as you're vegan, but like you could also be a vegan fascist, or you know, there's right, any number right. of ways somebody. So can be veganism on its own, right, is not anti-authoritarianism, but anti-authoritarianism right. must include veganism. Right. Yeah, I I especially think I especially think that veganism is important to that simply because, like I was saying before, about challenging those authoritarian relationships. Um, mm -hmm. I, I also want to add, because I can imagine, you know, I can imagine some people being like, oh my God, like, uh, oh, you know, it, 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 veganism, this ideology, it's like, okay, here's the thing, right? As a nihilist, I will say veganism is a spook. I will say that anarchism is a spook. I will say that individualism, nihilism, all these, all these different things, they're all spooks. They're not real. Their, their ideologies, but what mm -hmm. makes them real is when they are implemented in daily life. In right. other words, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, It's not just a word, it becomes practice. It, right. Yes, exactly. And I think, I think a lot of people like to treat veganism like it's some sort of like Christian ideology, some sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, like us vegans have to defend ourselves. It's like, no, fuck you. Like, you talk about fucking anarchy, like, how how is veganism and anarchy different in the sense that these are both relationships to the world around us, and they are relationships that encompass negating hierarchies that are intentionally built into relationships in order to preserve societies like this one. Like, at the end of the day, veganism is just a way of relating other beings and recognizing that I am not above anybody else you know what i mean but people are yeah. so fixated on the idea that like veganism is a fucking diet and i'm just like holy fuck especially if you're an anarchist come on like all that investigating all that researching you did to finally determine that you are an anarchist or a nihilist or an individualist you mean to tell me you're not going to put forth even half the effort to understand that <laughs> veganism is more than a fucking diet like, yeah. oh my God. you know, there, there's still people out there that feel like, oh, you know, veganism, you got to have money, you know, all this bougie food. It's not even like healthy food. It's like, okay, you can be vegan on like fruits and veggies just fine. You can fucking steal, you know, uh, luxury vegan food, which we do all the time because it tastes fucking great and it's fun to do. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people, like, I know I'm talking a lot, but honestly, what I think it boils down to is the difference between a self-identifying anarchist or individualist or nihilist versus a vegan is that you can be an anarchist, nihilist, individualist in theory. You can go around, tell people I'm a nihilist and you can, you know, recite script, you know, vegan, vegan right. or not vegan, anarchist, individualist, nihilist rhetoric. But veganism requires a material change in your life. And that change has so much of an impact 
that every time you go to a friend's house and you're like, oh, no, I'm vegan. I don't eat that. It causes controversy. You go to a family event. It causes controversy. You go on an anarchist forum. Hey, everybody, I'm vegan. Is anyone else vegan? Oh, God, vegans think they're this and that. It causes controversy. That's because it challenges people's fucking realities. It's not just a theory. It's not just like this fucking word. It is a way of life. And I think if one's anarchy isn't a way of life, then it's just fucking philosophy. You know? Right. You know, that, that funnily reminds me. And again, this relates to some war zone stuff. I'm I'm straight edge and I've been straight at I've been sober for two and a half years, I'd say. I went cold turkey on everything. Um oh, it yeah. reminds me that when I tell people like, oh yeah, like I think the attitudes have changed recently, but when I first was like, oh, I'm straight edge, I'm sober, people are like, come on, like, why do you have to t-? like it was kind of like the old, the way conservatives treat gay people, like, oh, like you didn't need to tell me that. Or like, right. oh, you're trying to you're trying to say something. I'm like, I'm just letting you know, like, because you know, I'm a you know, I'm 24 years old. Like a lot of people my age, what they want to do is go out and drink. I'm not judging them. It just that's the culture. They want to go out and drink, or they want to sit in and smoke. Like for example, like when I'm like, hey, let's go for a hike. They're like, yeah. Do you mind if I bring my weed? I'm like, why do you need that? Like, can we not? And so like when I talk about being straight edge, I think people being straight edge people respond the same way when people say they're like when you talk about being vegan people are like oh here we go like you're like i'm not even i'm not preaching veganism or straight edge to you i'm just telling you this is part of me right and people get very defensive because they i think i was talking to a friend about this last night deep down they know that you're right but they don't want to do it well you know because um there's there's a comfort in conformity there's the mm-hmm. comfort, you know, especially under capitalism, ironically, for anarchists who are supposedly anti capitalists, you know, there is a comfort in knowing, oh, yeah, you know, you vegans are fucking weird. Like, we could all just team up, you know, I'll go online and I'll tell everybody, like, you know, oh, yeah, fucking vegans, right? And everyone will comment and heart react and all this shit. And it's just like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I get it. Like, you have the rest of the world fucking behind you. Absolutely, you're right. But that is what makes us fucking weirdos. That's what makes us fucking freaks. That's what makes anarchy like a challenging and scary thing to a lot of people is because it challenges the comfort of conformity. And that conformity is based on hierarchy and oppression and all this like fucking eco destruction. And that's another reason why um why I am the way I am. People might think I'm I'm an asshole or I'm a dick because I'm like, quote, confrontational. But, you know, I'm not pointing a gun to anybody's head. I'm not telling everybody, you need to be vegan. Oh, my God, or I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> All I'm doing is I'm saying, oh, yeah, let's talk about it from a philosophical point of view. Like, you mm-hmm. tell me, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you find compatibility with, claiming to be, you know, an anarchist or an individualist or a nihilist, but also maintaining a relationship built on oppression, built on hierarchy, built on supremacy, built on morality, and backed up by capitalism with other animals, you know? Like, Mm -hmm. and people just shit. They shit. They, They don't know how, and they get real defensive, and usually if somebody starts getting very emotional about it and starts freaking out, I just leave it alone because I'm not trying to emotionally psyop anybody into being vegan either. It's just a lot of times all I have to do is say, Hey, I'm vegan, everybody. And they come to me. They come to me with all their same fucking claims and excuses. Oh, what about black people? What about poor people? This and that. And I respond to them and they get mad at me for responding. And then, you know, and and that's just kind of how it goes, right? But mm-hmm. <laughs> very cool. Well, I think like we're running out an hour here, and that's typically where we like to cap the episodes at, because you know after an hour, people are going to be like, "All right, wrap it the fuck up." So, I mean, unless there's, is there any last things, perhaps in the projects you want to endorse? We can give you the last couple minutes to talk about anything you wanna you want to platform uh check me out on soundcloud onyx spiral and uh i got a little song 
for my most loyal, hateful fans. Can I sing it? Oh, please. Oh, you, let's hear it. Yeah. So hot take. <laughs> Is it hot <laughs> I'm wait. I'm wait. I'm waiting. I'm at this suspense. It's building. No, I know. I know. I wanted to. I want hot take. If you ain't vegan, the anarchism is fake. Animal use that's a standard for which all oppression is based. Whether you're liberal, lefty, radical, or nihilist, the excuse is always the same. And it's ironic because y'all are the same motherfuckers that demonstrate for change. The normalized cruelty dietary prescription is at odds with this anarchist lifestyle I'm living. Every slaughterhouse prison supports the same system. A bloodbath and mass. Are you anarchists all listening? Too many excuses for this continued abuse. The radical root of being vegans to undermine and refuse. Sport and authority, man-made to cage and mutilate. Radical rhetoric's only theory when it lacks material change. I stay loud and blunt because being woke ain't enough. All you radical anti-vegans, I'm here to fuck up your bluff. Fake-ass carnivores and omnivores, check your anatomy. Wanna be predators with flat teeth, no claws, and clogged arteries. Yeah. <laughs> that's it we uh, this is i didn't expect hip-hop to take the direction of saying your anarchism is fake but i did you know <laughs> it, it, here we are you know uh it, it oddly uh reminds me of a mortal technique for anyone that knows anything about him he's kind of like a leftist marxist ra uh hip-hop rapper from peru um that talks about like you know quote unquote that deep shit uh, right. that vaguely reminded me if if in, in an alternate universe, I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So you know, I got a couple songs about like uh, straight edge radical sobriety, living in the hood, being poor, um, a lot of things like that. But that was one of the first songs I wanted to make. Um, you know, obviously I'm being playful, so people don't like yeah. freak. That's why I said hot take. You know, you know, hot take if you ain't vegan, the anarchism is fake. But um yeah. So there it is, y'all. <laughs> gotcha. Is there anything else besides the the SoundCloud project? Let nope. me ask you this, actually. We didn't get the to really talk about it, and we plan to. What's happening with the Green Scare Book Fair? Is that ha is it are we getting a are we getting a follow up event? What's happening? I would like to be honest, I would like to do it again. Uh I think the first the first one was great. A lot of people had a lot of fun. Uh, not everyone, like but you know, you know, just not everyone. Yeah, not everyone, not everyone. But more people than I expected came out. More people enjoyed it than I expected. Uh, people enjoyed it more than I imagined they would expect it because some people got tattoos on their bodies <laughs> to commemorate being there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I can only feel like, wow, maybe we should do this again. The problem is we don't have the space. So we could put the call out, you know, if uh, if you are somebody who might have a space to host it, um, you can email Warzone. Right. And we'll, right. Put the, we'll put the SoundCloud link as well as the Warzone's info in the description. So if anyone's interested, you can go check it out. Uh, oh, in yeah. the description. Right, All right. right. So a potential ideally it would happen uh is there is there anything else bobby do you want to speak to anything are there any zines or essays that that are coming out people should look at for um not not anytime super soon so <laughs> gotcha. i've got like personally i've got a couple pieces of writing that i am trying to finish but we're we're planning on train hopping uh, coming mm -hmm. up in May, we're going to be train hopping the, the East and West Coast. So I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of time to complete those projects. Um, so I guess kind of keep an eye out for them either late summer or like early fall, perhaps. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, this yeah. has been the Uncivilized Podcast. Have a good one.